Welcome to the Underground Dhamma Podcast, Episode 4, and I am here with Joanna. Hello, Joanna. Hi. Hi there. My name is Juan, as you all know. Most of our listeners are our friends, and uh, now anyone who doesn't know us, you're our friend as well. So welcome. Last week, uh, we had an episode where we talked about the fourfold supernormal reality and the eightfold supernormal path. And Joanna, we talked about how the emotions that come in conflict with reality and cannot accept reality bring suffering. We had to practice what we preached because last week uh, we were not able to have perfect audio. How was that experience? Uh, it was a little frustrating. Yes, definitely. I remember getting frustrated when I uploaded it and I'm like, wait, I just spent two hours talking with Joanna about this. I have to accept this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. It's a funny, uh, <laughs> funny joke the universe played on us. Let's see. They're, the universe was like, let's see if they really know what practice, what they preach. But uh, I thought that was <laughs> funny. So this week um, we have... Uh, a couple of topics on tap that I think are dear and near to our hearts. Uh, I shared with you, Joanna, um, an essay that I was assigned to read when I took an Asian philosophy course back in 2012. And this essay was about Zen, and it was from Alan Watts. It was a transcript of one of his, uh, one of his speeches. And I I think you found it pretty interesting as I found it, right? I did. I was like, uh, halfway through it, I was like, hmm. And then almost at the end, I was like, who wrote this? And then I went back up to the top to see the author's name. And then I saw Alan Watts and I was like, whoa. Yes. Because, <laughs> because after I read it, I was like, it seems as though this person who wrote this essay experience this like they know this yeah it's like they're speaking from experience yes and actually. that's why i was like really interested to see who wrote it and then when it was alan watts i was like whoa because it makes sense yes yes uh alan watts is uh amazing i remember i think i told you that when i was taking that class and when i've taken classes my whole life to be honest uh i never did homework i was a uh, I guess a not so great student because I didn't do the homework. However, I did understand the material. Um, but thankfully, my friend in that Asian philosophy class, my friend Ivan, uh, I hope you're doing well, Ivan, if you're listening, uh, he asked for my opinion on the homework. And so I decided to do this homework, which was reading this essay by Alan Watts. And, um, uh, you know, my life, Joanna, when it comes to the Dhamma, has been a, a series of convenient coincidences, which uh, I think we might call we we might call it synchronicities. And I think that um, I was very lucky to to read this essay, and I wanted to read the beginning of it just so that uh, people get the uh, taste of it. So I remember when I read the first uh, few sentences, it, it really surprised me because I had no real introduction to Zen. Um, I remember I during that class, uh, Asian philosophy course, we went over Confucianism, we went over Taoism, Hinduism, and then we finally got to Buddhism like towards the end of the class. And then we got to Zen. And I remember, I remember when we went over Buddhism, you know, it was the standard stuff and it really didn't bring the Dhamma to life for me. But then when I read this, I had like a paradigm shift in my experience. It kind of like blew my mind. So, um, this is an essay, a transcript of a speech called a lecture on Zen. And it starts with, a uh, Alan Watts talking about an old, uh, account between a student and a Zen master. And it goes, once upon a time, 
There was a Zen student who quoted an old Buddhist poem to his teacher, which says, The voices of torrents are from one great tongue. The lions of the hills are the pure body of Buddha. Isn't that right? He said to the teacher. It is, said the teacher, but it's a pity to say so. When I read that, I was very surprised. I'm like, what is he? This is so strange. This, this is so strange. <laughs> it's like such a magnanimous statement. And the teacher answered it so chill, agreed with it, and said it's a pity to say so. I know, Joanna, when we have conversations, when uh, you say sometimes I speak in the language of science, I get really analytical. But uh, recently we had a conversation where you said I was speaking the language of Zen. And um, when I kept saying, when you would ask me questions, I kept saying the more and more words that you use, the farther and farther we get a we, away we get. And I think that's kind of what this teacher was saying. You know, it is. He agreed that that's true what the student said, but he said it's it's a pity to say so. Did uh, that get you by surprise as well? Yeah, I didn't really understand it. I had to read it a few times. Yeah. Um, especially when it when I was trying to understand. First part, the voices of torrents are from one great tongue. The lions of the hills are the pure body of the Buddha. Yeah, you know. When I came across this Zen, I didn't fully understand it, you know, and still, you know, you can't really say you fully understand it as as the, the essay goes on to say. But I, I started to get the flavor and started to get the taste. And um, my eight to nine years since then, studying the suttas, uh, studying the teachings of uh, the teachers like uh, Bhante Kalita, Bhante Punaji, Bhante Sirinwaza, um, studying psychology and science. You know, the voices of torrents are from one great tongue. You know, that's, to me, that's a very quantum statement. You know, like, I feel like he's talking about physics here. Yeah, exactly. You know, when when a at with a subatomic a subatomic particle or a wave you know when when a particle is detected it's because we measured it and we we gathered some information on one of its properties which is the location but before we locate locate it by measuring it we we say that it is in superposition which superposition means that it is everywhere at the same time it's in every possible possibility they call waves a waves of possibilities and uh, you know we're not scientists here so i'm sure there's people that understand quantum physics more than this but this is a very basic understanding and yeah i, th I think you're right like that's to me that's a very quantum physics statement and you know someone who's thinking rationally would hear that and be completely confused, which Zen tends to do. What did happen to me in the first place. Yes. And I was like, okay, don't think about the words. Think about the experience. Think about yeah, like the, the ideas behind it, not just the words. Think about the ideas. So the torrents, it's like we're picking apart this puzzle and we're trying to figure out what it really means. So... The voices of the torrents. Obviously, torrents don't have voices, but to me, <laughs> the torrents, torrents are like uh, wind, wind, the thunder, everything in the weather, the things that we have no control of. They have voices, and are from one great tongue. Um, so it's kind of like we're thinking about the universe and yeah, the universe mm -hmm. that the universe has a voice. Mm. 
Yeah. And, you know, when do we really hear the, the, the planet? When do we really hear the earth better than when there is a wind? <laughs> and the thunderstorms. Thunderstorms, winds, oceans crashing, you know? Yeah. The, these are all conditions that are happening. It's really just one big, one big vibration. And there is no separation anywhere at all that we can see. It's only when we start using, uh, we, and we, when we start analyzing and categorizing, which the Buddha used to use this word called papancha, which means categorization. And, you know, once we start categorizing, we, we're separating everything and putting it into classes and yeah, that's doing that really is what what uh kills the living experience it kind of we start getting into the world of concepts at that point so it's very interesting so i just wanted to share that don't worry everybody this <laughs> this podcast won't all be very very confusing as that may seem to me it, it makes go ahead question though how is it that concepts kind of limit our way of seeing reality is that why papancha is that why papancha is even um identified because it's important to i feel like the buddha is trying to tell us that it's important to be aware that the way we categorize things in life limits our way of seeing reality like stops us from being able to actually see reality is that what is that why he addresses papancha yeah that's correct you know the buddha used to talk about nama and rupa naming and naming the image and we get fooled into take taking these names and these images as reality but these are just tools of animal perception of the human organism. They're not reality. This is just how the, the human organism makes sense of reality. And, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense that the human should categorize things so that we can put, place value to things so that we can uh, cultivate the things that will help us survive and stay away from the things that will will be detrimental to survival but you know we're not just animals anymore now we have the ability to think and reason and so we don't need to rely on these concepts alone to understand reality now we can go beyond concepts and going beyond concepts means going beyond words and images and, you know, this would be a perfect time. If I had a bell, I would ring it. And that experience of hearing that bell ring is different than the words that I just used to ex to describe that experience. Don't you think? Yeah. So that experience, we're, we're not using words, but it's just the sound hitting the eardrums, sending electrical chemical signals up the spine to the brain. Like those are all words I just described, but it's something that happens. That happening, that activity is the real experience. But the concepts I use to describe that experience, those are just concepts. They're categories. So that's why <laughs> even saying this poetic statement, the voices of torrents are from one great tongue, the lion's of the hills are the pure body of Buddha. Isn't that right? He said to the teacher. It is, said the teacher. But it's a pity to say so. That's what he was talking about. It's a pity to put everything into categories and conceptualize, because then that's not the that's not the reality. So um this this is a long essay. Don't worry, we won't go over all of it. Uh, but it's literally like this transcript is like 10 pages long. And there's a speech which I might link at the bottom in the description if you want to listen to Alan Watts, uh, um, his speech about Zen, which is this one that we're discussing. I'll have a link at the bottom to a video that, that has that. And 
that speech is 45 minutes long. So it's funny. It's, it's very funny that it's such a long speech, but he says, he goes on to say, it would be, of course, much better if this occasion were celebrated with no talk at all. And if I addressed you in the manner of the ancient teachers of Zen, I should hit the microphone with my fan and leave. But I somehow have the feeling that since you have contributed to the support of the Zen Center, in expectation of learning something, a few words should be said, even though I warn you that by explaining these things, I shall subject you to a very serious hoax. So he was saying like, the more and more words we use, the farther and farther away we get. So I'm going to subject you to a serious hoax of using words and to make you believe that you might understand something because of the words. But that's a hoax. The understanding comes from the experience. So uh, I told, I asked you, Joanna, um, to pick some quotes that we would like to go over just, you know, briefly. And uh, I guess maybe I can go first because uh, one of the quotes that was so transformative for me was uh, right in the first page. And I remember for a long time on my Facebook description, I had this quote because it, this, is, this quote was the, the thing that was so, it, it was so visceral, meaning like it was so, it, penetrated me down to my core to the bones to the marrow and uh so this quote goes like this now then if one so first i'll preface it the quote he says zen is a way of life a state of being that is not possible to embrace in any concept whatsoever so that any concepts any ideas, any words that I shall put across to you this evening will have as their object showing you the limitation of words and of thinking. So he goes on to say that from the very start. You know, that was the disclaimer. And then he goes on. Now then, if one must try to say something about what Zen is, I want to do this by way of introduction. I must make it emphatic that Zen in its essence, it's not a doctrine. There's nothing you're supposed to believe in. It's not a philosophy in our sense, that is to say, a set of ideas, an intellectual net in which one tries to catch the fish of reality. Actually, the fish of reality is more like water. It always slips through the net. And in water, you know, when you get into it and there's nothing to hang on to, all this universe is like water. It is fluid, it is transient, it is changing. And when you're thrown into water, after being accustomed to living on dry land, you're not used to the idea of swimming. You try to stand on water, you try to catch hold of it, and as a result, you drown. The only way to survive in the water, and this refers to the, particularly to the waters of modern philosophical confusion, where God is dead, Metaphysical propositions are meaningless, and there's really nothing to hang on to because we're all just falling apart. And the only thing to do under those circumstances is to learn how to swim. And to swim, you relax, you let go, you give yourself to the water, and you have to know how to breathe in the right way. And then you find that the water holds you up. Indeed, in a certain way, you become the water. So, that verse right there destroyed any concepts of reality I had up to that point. I believe I was uh, 23, 24 years old at that point when I came across this. And it destroyed every view of reality I ever, I've ever had. You know, at that point, I no, I no longer believed in a... a all-powerful God that created the world. So I was in that, in those waters of modern philosoph philosophical confusion where God is dead and metaphysical propositions are meaningless and there's nothing really to hang on to. And here he doesn't deny that. He doesn't, he doesn't give you something to hold on to. He actually tells you to let go even further. 
which, you know, having nothing to hang on to, Joanna, I think would bring a lot of people anxiety. But yeah. here he tells us to let go and to learn how to breathe. I I thought, yeah, go ahead. And um, have we, I think we have mentioned Alan Watts before. And I just want to make sure like people know why we're talking about Alan Watts, who he is and why his essay is such a big uh, is a big deal in your understanding. Can you just give like a little explanation of who he is, what he's done, and why uh, he's important? Yeah, absolutely. So Alan Watts, he was born in the 1920s, I believe. Um, maybe a little before the 1920s. And he was from England. And right from a young age, his mother was a procurer of Asian art. So she was traveling to the East, to China, and getting embroideries and paintings and bringing them over. And just seeing these arts uh, that were really coming from artists who were disciplined in a different way affected Alan Watts. He then went on to get into Zen, learn about Buddhism. And even as a 16 year old, he was writing for, for, uh, these, the theosophical society. He was writing for these, um, magazines about Buddhism. He was writing articles. Uh, there's even a book of all his writings when he was young called the spirit of Zen. He went on to write like 30 books about Zen reality, about Christianity, about Taoism, about my favorite book. If anyone has the ability to order the wisdom of insecurity, that book in the first chapter taught me more than my whole life up to that point. And I was like 24 at that point when I read that book, that first chapter was more educational than all my years in school and all my lessons up to that point. So he, he was a very smart individual and not just intellectually smart, but about reality. And he went on to become a, a priest and, um, he then gave up the priesthood, but while he was a priest, he was teaching the teachings of Jesus in the right way, showing everybody that Jesus was saying he, he was the son of God and just like anyone else can be the son of God. Everyone's the son of God and everyone can become godly like Jesus did. That Whoa. was, <laughs> that was the point of the gospels. The point of the gospels is hallelujah. I am the son of God and I'm going to tell everyone how they are the sons of and sons and daughters of God. They themselves are God. And he was teaching the young folks, the, the young folks, young folks uh, who went to the Christian church, they loved him. And, um, but then he left the, the church and he stopped um, trying to write about religion because he felt like the concepts in religion as the religion, as, as the Western people know it was kind of holding back the message, the message of reality, the message of awakening. And so he started just talking about reality straight up. You know, in that book, The Wisdom of Insecurity, he talks about dukkha and anxiety and the freedom from dukkha and anxiety. And he never mentions anything about religion. He He's able to use in plain words, he's able to talk about reality, experience, dhamma. And he was known to be the one of the greatest influences to the Western uh, civilization, uh, introducing the true teachings of Zen. Of course, he had teachers that influenced him who were doing work be, uh, earlier than him, like D.T. Suzuki, who wrote many Zen books. And But he was the one that introduced especially America. You know, I think you talk to anybody, any older American and who was interested in Buddhism, they probably have heard of Alan Watts. And Joanna, one time I, I went when Bhante Puniji was here in the North Hollywood Sarath Chandra Temple, I went to see him. You know, one day he was going to leave and Bhante Sanata Vihari messaged me saying, hey, 
Bhante, uh, Bhante Punaji is leaving tomorrow. Why don't you ask for a, a meeting with him? And I said, that's a great idea. Let me do that. So I, I called the Bhante Sriniwaza and I asked. And he said, yes, he's busy, but I'll arrange it. Bhante Sriniwaza hooked me up. And <laughs> the next day, I could tell that they just went up to Bhante Punaji's room and told him, hey, you have to go meet with someone. And I'm sure he didn't even want to. Like, he's like, all right, I'll go. <laughs> he went down there. And, you know, I I knew that, you know, in the tradition of, of Sri Lankan Theravada Buddhism, you know, you you talk to the monks and they, they help you with Dhamma and you usually give them a donation. So I just put some money in a, in a little envelope, but I also didn't want to just give him money. So I gave him a book. So at that point, I had been listening to his teachings on YouTube for like two years. And I was very well versed on his understanding of Buddhism, which in my opinion is the prototype teachings of the Buddha, meaning the original teachings of the Buddha, how he explains it. So you're talking about Bhante Punaji's teachings, right? That's correct. And so in Bhante Punaji's teachings, he says that dukkha is the insecurity of life. The insecurity of life is that we're going to get old, get sick, and die because everything is based on conditions, and whatever is based on conditions is unstable and brings this insecurity. So I thought, what an interesting coincidence that years before I even learned about Theravada Buddhism in terms of like practicing it in, in person, before I learned about Bhante Punaji, I came, came across Alan Watts and his teachings, and he had this book that changed my life called The, Inse the Wisdom of Insecurity. And I'm like, I'm going to give this book to him. I, I don't know if he knows who Alan Watts is, but I'm going to give it to him. So I met him. I asked him some questions. I, I, Joanna, I never told anyone, but I told them. I remember I asked him about becoming a monk. I said, Bhante, I want to be, become a monk but I don't think I'm ready yet to give everything up. And he goes, okay, don't do it. <laughs> very, very straight up. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, okay, yes, Bante. Another thing I, t I asked him that was very helpful. I'm like, oh no, this was later on. I'll share that for another episode. Um, but yeah, so then I gave him this book and I told him, here, Bante, I want to give you this book because this is Alan Watts. And he uses the word that you use for, for dukkha, insecurity. And he's like, thank you. And, you know, that was, we we said our goodbyes and he was off. He would later come back like like four months later after the Vasa, the rain, rain, rains retreat. But, yeah, so um, Alan Watts wrote this book, The Wisdom of Insecurity. It's amazing. And um, there's thousands of hours of talks on YouTube. All you have to do is look up Alan Watts. You have Alan Watts with music, Alan Watts with no music. Like it's, there's so much, so many talks. You'll never run out of talks. Um, I've run out of talks, but that's because I've been listening for like seven <laughs> years. <laughs> but I, I never get tired of listening and listening and listen. Um, but yes, that's who Alan Watts is. Um, and I shared my quote uh, about the water and learning to breathe, learn to swim, which by the way, this universe is like water, Joanna. Like yeah, we were talking about that, remember? Yeah, um, you brought it up before you even read this. That that your comment is what made me want to share this with you. Uh oh yeah. So one and me were talking about um quantum physics. Yeah. He, <laughs> I was trying to understand what he was talking about. And he was like, Yeah, so after he said everything, the very last thing he said was, so basically, like, it all, everything is just like a wave. Yes. Then I said, I said, oh, you know what? Just remind me of something I saw once. Well, something I noticed once a while ago. Sometimes uh, after, uh, during my lunch break, I'll go for a walk. And I will just, like, try to relax and just sometimes i'll just look at the horizon and i'll look at the trees and i'll see the wind like blowing the trees and then i notice that sometimes wind blows the trees the same way 
in which the ocean moves the seaweeds. Mm -hmm. It's like there's like these waves and they all move in harmony together. All the seaweed, if you ever watch uh, Discovery Channel and just uh, watch the ocean uh, recordings, how the sea life is under the ocean see how like the waves move the seaweeds everything flows in a certain way all at once in harmony and then that also reminded me when i saw the wind blowing the trees i saw all the tree branches and the leaves and they're all moving and swaying all in harmony in in the same following the same flow i was like that's what your your quantum physics uh lecture just reminded me of <laughs> then yes. i think I think you laughed at me, and then what did you say? I said, it's funny you say that. Um, I've heard something very similar from Alan Watts. And that's when I decided to share this with you. Yeah, and then I also compared it to how I observe people. Like people, mm, yes. like humans, we affect each our actions, our thoughts, our actions, our feelings affect everyone around everyone around you yeah like rip um, ripples in water yes and then i gave you an example and i said kind of like sometimes when uh i would go to the lobbies lobbies are like these big office like this big room where the clients would come and sit down and wait for their workers to help them at the welfare office they would sit in a big room together in rows and in some rows, uh, they had to like face each other, and sometimes it would be so packed. Like uh, some people would just be standing, you know, against the wall. And I noticed that if one person started getting uh, frustrated or angry and started expressing their anger vocally, verbally, next thing you know, there's like two other people doing it three other people doing it. Then next thing you know, the whole room is doing it. It was like w one little drop, two little drops, one ripple, two ripples, three ripples, four. It's like a wave. Like mm. your energy affects everyone around you. Your actions affect everyone around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why meta is so important. You know, if we're going to affect it, might as well affect it in a positive way. Yeah, and when you become aware of the fact that you affect everyone around you, I guess at that point, you start to value the power of metta or you start to understand the importance of metta. Yeah, the importance of metta, the importance of goodness, which uh, that's what sada is. Sada normally is translated as faith. But here it's like conviction and seeing the, the worthiness of goodness. The, you worship, to worship something is to see the worth in something. And you see the worth in goodness, which metta literally is a like universal benevolence, uni universal goodness. Uh, let's explain again real quick what metta is, just in case if anyone doesn't know. Metta meditation. Yeah, in metta meditation, you're cultivating these thoughts and images um, of just basically your hope you're wishing all beings to be well happy comfortable and peaceful and you wish them to be free from harm free from problems free from difficulties and you wish them to all live with ease and you picture this wave of goodness this wave of love getting bigger and bigger in concentric circles first first enveloping the your whole your room then enveloping the neighborhood then enveloping the city then enveloping the state then enveloping the country then enveloping the continent then enveloping the whole world and then enveloping the whole universe and even going beyond what we perceive as this universe into infinity with no exception. So, yeah, that's uh, the Buddhist idea of metta. Okay, and let's tie it back to what you were talking about earlier. 
So we we're talking about how this whole universe is water. And, you know, you mentioned how you had this idea already just by looking at your own experience. And you mentioned the seaweed being moved by the water. And I thought that was a perfect analogy because a fish, a fish is surrounded by water, but it may not even understand that. Nope, it's not aware. So in the same way, Joanna, the human being is surrounded in the water of perception. There's, we're swimming around in perception. Everything we encounter is perception, but we think it's not there. We're not aware of it. That's why we're unconscious and we're, the, we're sleeping and the Buddha is awake. We think perception is not there. And because we think perception is not there, we're not aware of it. And because we're not aware of it, we think we're separate. We think there's space and time. <laughs> By perception, you're talking about understanding the fact that uh, our experience in this world is being under is being witnessed through this body. It's right? yes, and by witness through this body, you mean it's being experienced by this organism and the experience. That's what you mean by perception. Yes. Perception is how we experience reality. This whole. So, mm -hmm. so we're swimming in, in reality and we don't realize that we're just experiencing everything. Yeah. We don't realize we're that body. we're unconscious of that fact. And because we are unconscious of that fact, we think that uh, there's a, a object that called me that exists. And we think there is an object and objects out there called the world that exists. And we think there's something called space in between, which we think is really nothing in between. But in really, in reality, it's just this one big wave and there's no separation. And this one big wave is the wave of perception. It's pretty, that's pretty, a very complex uh, idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what Alan Watson, I think, is trying to say here. Um, and then, well, go ahead and share a quote that you like. Um, hold on a second. Oh. There yeah. There was a sentence here where he talked about. I think about experiencing. You're talking about the essay, right? Yeah. So while you're thinking, um, I did want to share one other quote. He said, uh, he was talking about this reality and about how we experience it. And, um, he was talking about thinking and, um, in order to experience reality properly, you have to stop thinking. And that the oh my gosh, that's the page where I was gonna give you mm -hmm. my that's that was where my favorite quotes were. If you have it, go ahead. Okay, so he was talking. There's this paragraph in the essay where he's talking, comparing a Zen master walking to a cat walking. Mm, yes. Are you saying? Hold on. Uh. Um, okay, he says, he says, you are already there, and it is only a person who has discovered that he is already there who is capable of action, because he doesn't act frantically with the thought that he's going to get somewhere. He acts like he can go into walking meditation at that point. You see where we walk, not because we are in a great, great hurry to get to a destination, but because the walking itself is great. The mm. walking itself is the meditation. And when you watch Zen monks walk, it's very fascinating. They have a different kind of walk from everybody else in Japan. Most Japanese shuffle along or they wear Western clothes. They race and hurry like we do. And Zen monks have a peculiar swing when they walk. And you have the feeling that they walk rather the same way as a cat. There's something about it that isn't hesitant. They're just going along all right. They're not sort of vaguing around, but they're walking just to walk. 
And that's walking meditation. But the point is that one cannot act creatively except on the basis of stillness, of having a mind that is capable from time to time of stopping thinking. And so this practice of sitting may seem very difficult at first because if you sit in the Buddhist way, it makes your legs ache. Most Westerners start to fidget. They find it very boring to sit for a long time. But the reason they find it boring is that they're still thinking. Mm -hmm. If you weren't thinking, you wouldn't notice the passage of time. And as a matter of fact, far from being boring, mm. the world, when looked at without chatter, becomes amazingly interesting. The most ordinary sights and sounds and smells, the texture of shadows on the floor in front of you, all these things without being named and saying that's a shadow, that's red, that's brown, that's some, somebody's foot. When you don't name things anymore, you start seeing them. Because, say when a person says, I see a leaf, immediately one thinks of a spearhead-shaped thing outlined in black and filled in with flat green. No leaf looks like that. No leaves. Leaves are not green. That's why Lao Tzu said, the five colors make a man blind. The five tones make a man deaf. Because if you can only see five colors, you're blind. And if you can only hear five tones in music, you're deaf. You see, if you force sound into five tones, you force color into five colors. You're blind and deaf. The world of color is infinite as is the world of sound. And it is only by stopping fixing conceptions on the world of color and the world of sound that you really begin to hear it and see it. Mm, so that, was, that was one of my favorite parts. Sad, it's like, sad, whoa. <laughs> yes, yes. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's so true. It's so true. Who thinks like this? Who who in this ordinary world thinks like this? It's because I feel that in the Western world, we're like taught to think that we have to get to a certain place, that we have to do this. In order to be happy, we have to do this. In order to be happy, we have to do that. Or we think, we're taught to think, when you have this much money, then you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. You have this much things, then you'll be happy. Or when you have this amazing career or this amazing uh, record or accomplishments, then you'll be happy. But the truth is, I think what Alan Watts is trying to tell us in this essay is that happiness is not in the attaining of things or in the going to anywhere. Mm -hmm. It can be here. The, thing, the problem is that because of the way we're taught to think of happiness we think that we have to go chase it mm -hmm. we have to go run after it mm -hmm. we never get it we never get there we'll accomplish this goal but then there's another one and we'll accomplish that one and then there's another one when does it end and then you're never happy yeah so he's saying i mean to me the way i'm i interpret this statement that i just read basically he's trying to say why don't you just walk to walk for the sake of walking for the a pure enjoyment of walking so it, so he's kind of like telling me live for the pure enjoyment of living mm, sad, don't go yeah. chasing and running after things just enjoy what you do have enjoy moment yeah absolutely you know it reminds me of uh, something you told me when you were walking back from your break at work and you're doing walking meditation and you're like just oh, walking. Like <laughs> and like people are looking at you and you're just walking. You're not not to get somewhere, just the point was walking. I was walking like really slow. I was like taking my time, just doing one step at a time, one step at a time. And then I noticed that each person that passed by me would just look at me like we were wondering what's wrong with her. Why is she walking so slow? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then eventually I got closer to the building where I work. And then I saw a group of coworkers. They were chatting and talking. 
before I even reached them, they were looking de- looking up the block at me, wondering why I I didn't really notice them till I got a little closer. But I realized they were all staring at me, and I was just like walking, walking. <laughs> Then one of them was smiling and looked at me. And she was like, hey, Joanna, I can tell you sure don't want to go back in there, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I looked at her and I smiled and I just kept walking and walking. Mm. Yeah. Sounds so peaceful. Sounds like, like a cat walking. If we if we think of a dog walking, he like kind of skips along like fast, you know, skipping, 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 skipping. And he's always going to somewhere and like smelling this and smelling that and running on to the next thing, seeing something and chasing after it or, you know, but you see a cat, he's sitting, he starts like licking under his leg. He looks around slowly, calm. He gets up and he walks. You see his shoulders like moving so slowly. He's not going anywhere. He's not frantically running somewhere to get somewhere. He's just walking. And then when he feels like sitting, he just sits. <laughs> That's how I feel. That's how I picture you walking. <laughs> <laughs> like the Zen months, Wait, like a cat. There was another part of the essay where, uh, hold on. I did want to say in like, um, cause I had, I had a highlighted, um, a th- something he said that goes right with what you just said. Um, he says, um, you know, he talks about how the point is not to get somewhere. The point is to see that right here and now is the supernormal experience. And is the somewhere. Yes, you're already here. And, you know, everyone goes around chasing, trying to get somewhere, but they don't know that they're already here. And, you know, he quotes a Zen master, Hokuju. He says that they find this supernormal experience in the very simplest things of everyday life. And he says, in the words of the poet Hokoju, marvelous power and supernormal, supernatural activity in drying water and carrying wood. You know, yeah. He that the Zen masters. That's why if you go to a Zen retreat, they're gonna put you to clean and to work. Why? Because they want free labor. No, <laughs> they're teaching you that there's no difference in sitting down and meditating. And in everyday life, there is no difference. You know, that's why Bhante Kalita tells us that you practice meditation from the moment you wake up to the moment you fall asleep. Can I read another part of it? Yes, please do. Okay, so there's this other part. It says, but you see, it's difficult to understand language like that and to understand what all that is about there is really one absolutely necessary prerequisite, and this is to stop thinking. Now, I'm not saying this is this in the spirit of being an anti-intellectual, because I think a lot, talk a lot, write a lot of books, and I'm a sort of half-baked scholar. But you know, if you talk all the time, you will never hear what anybody else has to say. And therefore, all you'll have to talk about is your own conversation. The same is true for people who think, who think all the time. That means when I use the word think, talking to yourself, subvocal conversation, the constant chit chat of symbols and images and talk and words inside your skull. Now, if you do that all the time, you'll find that you've, you've, you have nothing to think about except thinking. And just as you have to stop talking to hear what I have to say, you have to stop thinking to find out what life is about. And the moment you stop thinking, you come into immediate contact with what Korzybski called so delightfully the unspeakable world. Mm. That is to say, the nonverbal world. Hmm. Some people would call it the physical world, but these words, physical, nonverbal, are all conceptual, not a concept either. It's, it's bang stick. So when you are awake to that word, you suddenly find that all the so-called differences between self and other, like self and other, life and death, pleasure and pain, are all conceptual and they're not there 
They don't exist at all in that world which is bang's stick. In other words, if I hit you hard enough, ouch, doesn't hurt. If you're in a state of what is called no thought, there is a certain experience, you see, but you don't call it hurt. It's like when you were small children. They banged you about and you cried and they said don't cry because they wanted to make you hurt and not cry at the same time. People are rather curious about the things they do like that. But you see, they really wanted you to cry the same way if you threw up one day. It's very good to throw up if you've eaten something that isn't good for you. But your mother said enough and made you repress it and feel that throwing up wasn't a good thing. Because then when you saw people die and everybody around you started weeping and making a fuss, and then you learned from that that dying was terrible. When somebody got sick, everybody else got anxious and you learned that getting sick was something awful. You learned it from a concept. Mm. So it's like he's saying that when you are able to shut down the, the mind and to if you're able to just let go of the thoughts and just be present, you experience life in a completely different way. Mm. Absolutely. He called he quoted Korzybski, who was uh the father of modern uh, semantics. Uh, he he quoted him and he said the unspeakable world and um you know joanna that's the experience that's the that's the experience without thinking without naming without uh, conceptualizing without categorizing where you're free from this yeah and so the categorizing that you're talking about is when he was talking about oh when they they when as a baby, they told you, don't cry. Like they would, they banged you and they, they told you, don't cry. And then, um, yeah, basically he's saying as a child, you're learning these behaviors. You're learning how to interpret these behaviors. Like, uh, you learn that throwing up is bad. So because your mom said, even yeah. Yeah. And then you learn that dying is bad because you saw people crying and sad. And then you learned that um, you learned getting sick was bad because everyone would get really worried and scared when people were sick. Yeah. These are all things that are learned concepts. They're all learned behaviors. Everything is a learned behavior. Like when he was saying when you got banged and you cried... And they told you not to cry. You cried anyways. Yeah, um, he, he talks about the contradiction, how they tell you not to cry, but they really want you to cry. <laughs> I like they think if you don't cry, then it, there's something wrong with you. So yeah. <laughs> yep, that's funny. Um, yeah, like, so imagine if you, they banged you on the head as a little kid, right? And you didn't cry. Imagine how they would react. They're going to think something's wrong with you and they got to teach you how to react how to behave when that experience happens which is the category <laughs> getting hit means yeah. you cry yeah and then like also when you see some as a child when you would see someone get hurt they would start crying and they would make a big fuss about it and it would be dramatic right yep but it's a learned we learned it we saw it from someone so we think oh this is the way we have to react or <laughs> yeah like when your parents or if your parents had a an argument or if they broke up or separated and you saw the way they reacted, they behaved. They behave like if the world is gonna end, like if it's the end of the world, and then they'd have tantrums and cry and then they'd be really, really sad and heartbroken. And then as you get older and you go through a breakup, you're like, What do I wait, what am I supposed to do now? Oh, I think this is the part where I'm supposed to cry. Okay, what do I do now? Oh, I think this is the part where I have to feel really, really sad. Yep. Okay, what do I do now? Oh, this is the part where you have to call them back and try to get back together. <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> you're scared of the unknown. <laughs> well, not only that, but this is what happened when I'm, this is what I saw my parents do. So I think this is what, we don't, we're not aware of this, but subconsciously it's there. Like you don't know, you don't even know why you're doing it, but you saw it somewhere yeah and imagine imagine you you have now after 
doing this since you were a child. Like I told you that when I read The Wisdom of Insecurity in that first chapter, I learned more than I had learned in my first 24 years of life. So that means that from when I was young to 24, I had created this matrix of concepts and ideas called reality. And just reading this essay and reading that book destroyed all those concepts and realities that I thought were real, that I thought that's what was reality. And Alan Watts freed me. <laughs> he, he, he sparked my flame to burn down this, this house of concepts of categories that I had been accustomed to. And, uh, that's what he called Zen. Zen is, he said that in the same way that in the Western world, you know, everyone goes through the, the education system. Then after they're, a, a, as they're an adult, they have to go see a therapist to, to undo all the harm that was created by this education system. And <laughs> in the same way, that's what Zen is. It's, he says, it's like when you cure meat by salting it to preserve it, when it's time to eat it, you have to take off the salt. And that's what Zen is taking the uh, Zen is destroying these concepts that we take as real. And it tries to do it by getting into the unspeakable world. The unspeakable world is the world where the chatter, the vo the sub vocal chatter in the mind stops. And Joanna, did you know that the Buddha, he, he told us at what point the sub vocal chatter in the mind stops? He told us that in the second jhana, the verbal constructions stop. And oh. the second jhana, the questioning and answering, which answering is, is basically make, coming to conclusions about reality. And uh, that stops in the second, in the second jhana. And Do is, you know there's, there's people that are not aware that they question their that while in their mind chatter, they question things. Yeah, it's crazy, huh? <laughs> There's people who are not aware that when they breathe in and when they breathe out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's true. Yeah. So, you yeah. Know this because I noticed it about myself because uh, I was reading about through my, as I'm, I was learning about Buddhism. I think I was reading something uh, by Alan Watts, or I can't remember who. They were like, uh, your mind is always in constant chatter, and your mind is always questioning things. And then I stopped and I thought about it, and I was like, oh my God, yes, that's true. And it's like, you can't stop it. You can't just shut it down. It's hard. Yeah, you you can't. You're right. You can't stop it. You can't. That's why there's a part in... Uh... That I don't know if you read it or it was in our discussion before the podcast where he's like, you can't do it by doing something about it and you can't do it by not doing something about it. <laughs> it's like both are yeah. both are trying to get somewhere where you're not. You're talking about the essay or this essay, right? Yeah. At the very beginning, the very first paragraph, no? Uh, I don't think it's in the very first paragraph. It's, it's definitely in the first. Might have been the second one. In the, the first, first few paragraphs for sure. Yeah, uh, he said. You can't do, you can't make it happen by doing something and you can't make it happen by not doing something. Yeah. So it's something in between. Yeah. This is why. Guess, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I guess it leads to Buddhism because I know the Buddha said something and I think you were going to talk about the jhanas. Well, yeah. I mean, so, you know, um, we had a, a, a new person go to our uh, meditation class and um, she was asking about how to stop thinking. And, you know, we can't stop thinking. Even if you tried, you can't stop thinking. Like you just mentioned your own experience where you realize you can't stop it. So you don't, you know, in, in terms of what the Buddha taught, he didn't teach us to stop thinking. First, he just taught us to stop uh, to choose our thinking. That's the first step is selecting your thinking. And then by selecting your thinking, your organism starts to calm down and relax. And then when you choose your thinking, you no longer have any emotional thoughts. 
And when you no longer have any emotional thoughts, you go into jhana, into ecstasy. And then in ecstasy, you still have the thinking portion, but now it's complete unemotional thinking. And then it goes to an even more peaceful state of mind. And that's when you go into the second jhana. And that's when the subvocal chatter in the mind stops. You know, jhana, what is jhana? Jhana is Pali. And what's Sanskrit for jhana? Uh, Sanskrit is dhyana. And what's Chinese for dhyana? Chan. And what's Japanese for chan? Zen. So Zen is really jhana. So wow. this is why they understand this. You know, in Zen, they were reforming Buddhism because Buddhism had strayed away. Even Theravada Buddhism, who's supposed to practice the original teachings of the Buddha, even they strayed away. They were all concentrating and they were not relaxing and uh, they were getting, they were lost. And then in China, when Zen got there, they were all worshiping and they thought worshiping and Kama and rebirth was the real Dhamma. But in Zen, they taught them, you know, they thought this because they were caught in the world of concepts. And if you're caught in the world of concepts, you're caught in the world of existence. You're not you're not in tune with the world of experience, which is the unspeakable world, the world that cannot be put into categories. One time they asked a uh, venerable Mahasariputta, they asked him about nirvana. And he said, you can't categorize that. It, it doesn't belong in the world of categories. There's, it doesn't belong in the world of name and image. And that's the unspeakable world. It can't be categorized. But yeah, this essay is tremendous. I recommend everyone to read it. It's like uh, Robert Anton Wilson, Joanna, used to say that sometimes books, sometimes uh, sci-fi movies or shows, they're like LSD trips. And this essay is like an LSD trip. It can cause a paradigm shift. But yeah, thank you for sharing uh, the parts that you like. Thank you for reading it. Um, I, I, I'll never forget this essay. And from time to time, I'll go back and read it or I'll listen to it because it's in a, it's a speech. And I, um, I'm going to post the speech, so I'm sure you'll be listening to it as well. Juan, I have a question for you. Yes. Okay, so now that we've discussed Zen, what Zen is, which is basically... Uh, concept concept of jhana where there is no thinking and just peace right mm -hmm. okay so what we've discussed earlier zen can be practiced through everyday life moment to moment every day with you know no matter what you're doing yeah correct? yeah you don't have to be a monk to practice it Exactly. So my question is, so if you know that you can practice Zen or you can meditate every minute of every day, why become a monk? Yep. <laughs> you know, Juan, that that's my question. Why would you become a monk if you know you can practice whenever you want? Mm. And you're asking me specifically because... Yes, I'm asking you specifically <laughs> because you have like... Uh, I know most people, for whoever is not, you know, doesn't know you uh, very well, one of the main reasons why I was inspired to start a podcast with Juan is because uh, the very first moment I heard him speak the Dhamma, I think I mentioned in our first podcast that my mind stood still. And I could see the concepts and ideas that you were explaining in your scientific language. I understood it. And it, and it was so clear to me. And, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> I understand what he's saying. And then I wanted to know more. I knew that it was not very common to hear people speak the way you spoke. And, uh, and I wanted to hear more. I wanted to learn more about what you knew. I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta make him my friend. I want to see what else he knows. And then, um, 
So as I learned more about you, I realized you have like an encyclopedia. Your brain is like an encyclopedia of Buddhism, Dhamma, philosophy, science. And like you remember so many things, like you really understand them very well. And um, I feel that I have recognized this through my own understanding of science, biology, uh, chemistry, Yes. Just through my own studies that I've done in school, I can recognize and see that you are you are very knowledgeable in these fields, so these fields of study. So also I can also see your uh passion and interest for the Dhamma, which is Buddhist philosophy and teachings. You know, I have seen that you know the, the suttas very well. You know a lot of them by heart. You have studied, you know a lot of the Pali language. You're studying Pali. You know a lot of Pali uh, compared to the average Latino guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my question is, because I see that you are very passionate about the Dhamma, I mean, it would be logical for me to imagine that you would want to become a monk which however <laughs> which i have said in the past that i want to become a monk and yes uh, the close yes. people in my life know that which is why you're asking this yes so now recently i have come to understand i mean i've heard it before so many times but you know how you can hear things so many times and not really understand it yes recently i have come to understand that practice meditation to really understand and experience this zen concept or this zen state of mind is by practicing meditation like 24 7 in everything you do and being present in the moment being here and realizing this is the it mm. this now is the it yep and knowing that you can do this on your own juan why would you want to become a monk then <laughs> Very good question, and you laid it out perfectly. You laid out the dilemma perfectly. So, and you asked me before this, and I said, let's, uh, I'll tell you the answer on the podcast. So, what happened, Joanna, in Zen when it first came over um, after World War II, because um, Americans were in Japan, and some of the soldiers uh, and um journalists they all they were introduced to japanese zen they brought it back to america and that's when i don't know if you've heard of the beat generation started the beat generation was like where all these artists started thinking like oh we we don't have to do the norm we can do whatever we want and um a lot of people got the idea that zen is there's no concepts there's no doctrines there's n you don't have to change anything you just live your life and that's zen and they they started doing all this weird stuff and even in the sutta i mean not at the sutta well it's a sutta to me but in the essay we just were referring to uh alan watts talks about this he says that in uh and one of the most difficult, he, this is, I'm quoting him now. And one of the most difficult things, this belongs to, of course, the generation we all know about that was running around about some time ago where they caught on to Zen and they started doing anything goes painting. They started doing anything goes sculpture. They started doing anything goes way of life. Now I think, now I think we're recovering from that today. So basically he was saying that these people thought they understood what Zen was and just said, all right. There's no goal. I don't have to do anything. Let me just do whatever I want. Well, that's not what Zen is. Um, you know, first of all, you know, I can't say what Zen is, but I can give you, I can, I can talk to entertain. And that's what I'm doing. In Zen, you wake up in every moment. Every moment is a supernormal experience. And that only happens when you can be calm, when your mind is still, and when you can relax to the point where the thinking is not, is not so overbearing. And yes, you can do this in everyday life. That's, that's the, beauty, the beauty of Zen, that you don't have to become a monk to do this. 
And in Zen, when you're doing it properly, you're okay with anything because you have this imperturbable serenity. You have this, they, that's why when people associate the word Zen, they associate it with being chill. You know, they, they always say, let me Zen out or let me get my Zen they, they, because it's chill, it's relaxing. And so a lot of Zen people who may not properly understand Zen will say like, hell no, I won't become a monk. Why do I want to become a monk? That's doing something. The point is not to do something. Well, they don't understand that being chill, being imperturbable, relaxed, not being overwhelmed by the thinking, that that can happen, if that can happen in everyday life of a lay person, it sure as hell can happen in everyday life as a monk as well. It's like someone who says, no, we can only dance the waltz. We can only dance the lambada. We can only dance tango. But Zen means you can dance any type of dance. You can do uh, break dancing. You can do the robot. You can do any type of dance. Or for people who say Zen is only uh, classical music, or Zen is only rock, or Zen is only hip hop. No, but Zen is anything. You can do Zen in anything. So I think the most beautiful dance that I would like to do is becoming a monk. <laughs> and I would do that as a dance. And you know, in dancing, Joanna, there's no point to, there's no, you're not trying to achieve something in dancing. You're not trying to get anywhere in dancing. The point of dancing is to dance, to be in the moment and to relax and to have fun. That's, that's what Zen is. And that's what I feel I would like to do as a monk because it's fun. You know, the normal, per oh. the normal person thinks that being a lay person means you enjoy the senses and being a monk means that you deny yourself. But they think that being a monk is becoming an, a, it's like self mortification, but that's not, that's not what it is. The Buddha talked about that you should neither, uh, be so, uh, indulgent in the senses and you shouldn't also be, uh, mortify the body. Uh, becoming a monk is not the ex any of these extremes. It's living a harmonious, happy life. Oh, I just want to say, Juan, whenever I see the monks, all the monks I've ever seen, they look really peaceful. Peaceful and very happy. You know, yeah. monks are not supposed to laugh, you know, according to the tradition. Monks are not uh, supposed to laugh in front of lay people. But if, oh my gosh. But if, I don't know if I could be a monk. But if if you're there when the lay people aren't there, they're laughing. They laugh. They're 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 having a good time. You know, I've been lucky to where I've had, I've been able thanks to whatever actions in the past that have been skillful. I have been able to become friends with the monks, and I've been able to hang out at the at the at the temple. You know, whether I'm doing some sort of. Uh, cleaning or, or working on the temple or whether I'm just there to visit the monks, I've been able to, to make, be friends with them. And I see how it is, you know, it's, it's a beautiful dance and a Zen character can truly be quote unquote Zen in any situation. So for those who say that, no, being Zen is not becoming a monk because you can do it in everyday life they're the ones that are still categorizing they're the ones that are still conceptualizing they're slaves to conceptualizing you can do zen in anything which just means becoming completely relaxed and being completely here right now not not being uh, motivated by things you're trying to achieve or, or things you're trying to get that doesn't mean you won't achieve stuff or you won't get stuff, but that's not what moves you. Don't be obsessed by it. Don't be obsessed by it. Don't have these expectations. Uh, don't, don't, don't make up these concepts that, that you think will bring you happiness. It's being here completely, uh, present. And, um, uh, so yeah, so it, I would like to become a monk, you know, um, when the time is right. 
I'll jump into the line and start dancing. <laughs> yeah. So this, you know, has been all about Alan Watts. Um, and, you know, he, everyone, I suggest you go read a book of Alan Watts, listen to a talk of Alan Watts, look him up on, on online. Um, you know, John, I don't know if I ever, I think I've told you, but one time, you know, six months later, after I gave Bonte Punaji that book on Alan Watts, yeah. I, w I went to a retreat in Palmdale, the Palmdale Temple with Bonte Punaji. And he brought up, he's like, he told, he was talking to everybody in the group, the meditators. He said, have you read? And he was, I think he was responding to, to one of my <laughs> questions. He's like, have you read? the book the insecurity of uh, uh the wisdom of insecurity and i said yes bonte and here in my mind i'm like does he realize i gave him that book like six months ago <laughs> i'm like or is he busting a zen trip on me yeah is he messing, messing with, with me <laughs> so i'm like yes bonte he goes alan watts understood the teachings of the buddha he knew the teachings of the buddha now i'm not saying that he was an arahant but he understands the teachings of the buddha so he he co-signed alan watts just like i co-signed alan uh. watts and uh, he said you should read this book many times <laughs> not just once many times so if you don't want to take my word and if you know Bonte Punaji and you respect Bonte Punaji, go read the insecurity, the wisdom of insecurity, the wisdom of insecurity by Alan Watts. It'll change your life by changing your, your, the way you think and free you. Shifting your paradigm. Shifting your paradigm. That's right. All right. So I did have a, another topic, Joanna. Um, uh -huh. I, I know I told you that I wanted to discuss a Dhammapada verse. And um, there was yeah. two that we were going to discuss, but let's keep it at one just to uh, so we don't go too long. How, how long do we have? So far, we're about um, an hour and 17 minutes, which I think we're doing great. And I, I feel amazing. Um, so, Joanna, you brought up on episode one about you were very um, interested in this practice of the real alchemy. Alchemy means... You know, in oh, an, the clouds. Yeah. So in history, alchemists, alchemy, they thought was uh, being able to turn base metals, you know, normal metals into gold. That was yeah. that was the 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 motivation of alchemy. And then yeah. in, in like esoteric circles, they, they were trying to alchemy. They thought was finding an elixir for immortality. Uh, that's why a lot of Taoist uh, sages died from mercury poisoning because they were like taking all these elixirs trying to find the elixir to Im immortality. Um, but you, we discussed the real alchemy, which is turning negative energy into good energy. And oh, yeah. so this, you know, you wanted to discuss this, but I wanted to find a way to find this idea in the, in the Dhamma. And I didn't just want to discuss it. I wanted to find in the Buddha Dhamma. And, you know, when I first went to the temple, I, I, I went to the temple because I met Bhante Sidiniwaza at my job right after I had been studying Alan Watts for a few years. And um, I told, I was still new. I told, I saw a monk walk into my job and I ran to him and I said, hello, um, are you a Buddhist monk? And he goes, yes. And I say, wow, I'm new to the path. And he goes, oh, that's wonderful. And I said, yes. And, and then he said, you should come to my temple. Uh, and I said, okay. And he wrote the, the address on my business card. And I still have that business card. And that was in like 2013. Um, and he, so I went to the, I didn't go to the temple immediately. It took me like a year after to go. Cause I was, I don't know, you know, you're, you're always hesitant for new things or things that are unknown. Um, yeah. so when I finally started going, you know, about a month in, um, I asked Bonte Sidiniwasa, I said, 
Bonte, is there a mantra that you can give me? Because, you know, I was, I didn't know what the the real teachings of the Buddha, the proto prototype, the original teachings of the Buddha were. You know, there's no mantras in Buddha in the in the original teachings of the Buddha. Uh, but I nonetheless, nonetheless, I asked him, is there a mantra, Bonte, that you can give me for when I am scared? And he goes, yes. He, you know, he didn't tell me, no, mantras are not part of Buddhism. He said, yes here and he wrote it down in this little book i have and i still have it he he wrote it down in my book and he said saba papasa akaranam kusalasa upa sampada sa chita pario dapanan etan budana sa sanan and you know i started he told me what it was but i couldn't i didn't remember it immediately but then this poly right that that's poly and what it means is uh, saba means all. Papasa means evil, uh, like harmful. Saba, papasa, akaranam. Akaranam means throw it away, get rid of it. So saba, papasa, akaranam, to get rid of or refrain from all evil. And then he goes, Kusalasa upasampada. Kusalasa is good. Uh, upasampada is to enter, to take take up. So get rid of all evil and to take up and enter what is good. Sa chita pario dapanan. Sa chita is, chita is the mood, the mind. And sa is kind of like the Spanish su. Como si te, uh, I'm going to speak some Spanish, uh, Joanna. Si te digo su cuerpo, what does that mean? Uh, his body. Yep, his or her body. So the sa chita, chita is the, the mood, the uh, affect experience of the mind. So sa chita, that means su chita, um, your mind. Pario da panan, that means to purify it, to Purify your own mind. Etan budana sasanan. Etan budana is this is the Buddhas. Uh, sasanan is the te this is the teaching of all Buddhas. Sasanan is like the the dispensation. So to get rid of all evil, to refrain from all evil, to cultivate what is good, and to purify one's own mind. This is the teaching of all Buddhas. And so this reminded me of what you said. What was your what did you do in, in at work for in your practice? When pe oh. when people come up to you all agitated, emotional, and negative? So through the practice of breathing meditation, I learned to go inside instead of allowing my body to take over me and do the flight or fight or flight reaction which is the physical reaction your body has when you are afraid or when you feel that your life is in, in harm. When you feel threatened by anyone, anyone's hostility or anyone's verbal aggression, your body, your heart will start to beat fast. You'll, you'll have this feeling that you're not safe. You'll have this feeling that you're being threatened. And your body, your heart will beat fast. Your, your body will become tense. And basically, your body is naturally getting ready to attack or to run away from danger. So I noticed that every single time I would interact with a client that was becoming hostile or verbally aggressive and angry because they were not uh, being approved for or receiving something, they were not getting what they wanted for whatever reason, um, I would become scared and I would become angry and I would uh I would feel like like these emotions and these um yeah my body would react a certain way and no matter what I did I couldn't no matter what I told myself I my body would still react the same way mm -hmm. until I started doing the breathing meditation so through the breathing meditation I learned to just go inside and become aware of this reaction fully in my body and then like consciously or 
for that awareness of this, this reaction that was taking over my body, through the awareness of it, I was able to relax my stomach, relax my hands, my shoulders. Then I was able to breathe a little bit more normally. And, and yes. then just like breathe and just sit there and listen to the client, regardless if they were yelling or cussing me out, just relax. And then I would look at them and I would look at them in the eye and I would listen. And, but I was still being present inside. Yes. And I was paying attention to my body. And then like magic, the clients would then relax and mm. then they would like calm down and then they would start talking about something else something personal and and next thing i know they're crying about something and then i'm like i'm sorry that happened to you or this or that and then i'll be like i'm so sorry you're not eligible for the program um why don't you come back on this date where you can try again maybe uh because you can only apply you can only receive this assistance once a year come back on this day perhaps you'll you'll have a better chance of meeting the requirements and then they'll be like okay and then they'll be like thank you and then they'll walk away mm. like um yes so that's the so, real th that's the real alchemy that you did yeah cuz i i think i turned their negative energy into positive energy instead of spitting back negative energy at them I was able to go inside myself and relax my body and control myself, control my emotions by letting them go, relaxing the body, letting the emotions go. I was able to actually turn this negative situation into a positive situation where the client realized they were becoming emotionally irrational and uh, disrespectful and they would actually calm down. Sometimes they would even apologize. And they would actually leave with um, kind of like, you know. Yeah. you. They would leave peaceful. Um, yeah. So you know what's funny about that, Joanna? What? You did what the Buddha did to all his assassins that tried to kill him. They, <laughs> they all ran. They all were, got hired to go assassinate the buddha and what did the buddha do uh, nothing he would just like treat them with kindness he well, actually no he was a very very smart guy he knew what he was doing he knew he, he knew not to let them take over his emotions he knew not to react emotionally negatively and he knew what they needed to hear in order to like Calm them down. And he converted them. He did the alchemy too. Every assassin never came back to the kings who sent him. No, they became monks. They became monks. So you practice what all the Buddhas practice. And that's why I brought up this Dhammapada verse, which is Dhammapada verse number 183. And so you said you would not, uh, you would let go of the emotions. Uh, the let go of the emotions is the saba papasa akaranam because all that's evil is the emotions and you akaranam you threw them away you let them go and then uh, kusalasa upasampada you cultivated what is good which in this situation is the introspection you cultivated what is good because it's good because it's good for you and good for others to become conscious of your reaction because that would allow you to not be overwhelmed by the emotion. And then by giving up the papasa, the evil, the, the emotional experience, by letting go of it, letting go of all evil, you, you cultivated what was good, which was the introspection, the breathing meditation in the moment, you were able to purify your own mind. Sa chita pariyo dapanan. You purified your own mind. Etan, but etan buddhana sa sanan. This is the teaching of all Buddhas. This is what the Buddha did to his assassins who who went to kill him. He he was able to 
practiced this teaching of all Buddhas, and it transformed his he, he, it, his mind was already purified completely, and it was able to transform his assassins. Here, you're, you purified your mind by practicing this, giving up what is evil, cultivating what is good. You purified your mind, and you transform your clients who may have been overwhelmed by emotion. Yes, so this is the thing, Juan. I knew that my job was stressing me out because I had to have these negative interactions and I was like, I don't want to feel this. I don't want to make them angry. I want us all to be happy. I want us to get along. How can I do this? Is it me? Is it them? How do I change it? And then one day I saw a worker have an interaction with a client and she pretty much told her she was being denied for a program that she had applied for. And the way that she handled it, she looked at the client in the eye. She was very calm and very patient. And the, the client did not, she got a, I mean, she was upset and disappointed, but she did not have like an emotional outburst. And I really yeah. liked the way she handled it. So I asked her if I could watch her. And then she's like, okay. So I watched her and I observed her. And then I tried what she did and it worked. But there were still other clients that were really difficult to deal with that regardless of how you handled it, how kind you were or anything, they were still going to have that emotional outburst. So I think that's when I was like, there has to be another way that, that, you know, I want to get rid of this. I want to let, because the emotions would still come up in me. I could still feel them. And of course they will always come up. But the question was for me, how to, how do I let them go? How do I not let it bother me so much? And I wanted to let them go. So when I went into, when I studied meditation at the temple, I saw a way of letting them go by becoming aware of the body and how uh how i was everything how i was experiencing things like becoming aware of my stomach my breath the breath body yes and then becoming aware of the the tension in the body yes the feeling if you're breathing yeah if your breathing is relaxed you're going to notice that your body is relaxed too. Mm -hmm. So during my interactions with the clients, I would start focusing on my breath. And then I noticed my breath, my breathing was becoming short and shallow. Mm -hmm. So then I noticed that my stomach was like, wasn't even moving. <laughs> yeah. Like normally when you're relaxed, and you breathe, you can feel your stomach, your diaphragm your dry diaphragm expanding so you're basically your belly is like rising. expanding out it's rising out and then then it, it goes back and then it rises out you can feel it you know and you feel it's relaxed and you feel it rising and and falling and falling rising and falling and then um so during those heated interactions I noticed my stomach was like tight, tight, tight. Like yeah. I was not breathing at all. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was breathing, but very, very like short breaths. I couldn't, my stomach, my stomach was not rising at all. So yeah. I was like, okay. And then I would feel it like I would relax. That was the very first part, my breath. That was the very first thing I would notice. Yes. My, my breath body and my belly. And, and then I would like relax my belly and then I could relax my breath. Yes. And then, then once I could relax the breath then I could relax the body. Mm. And once I was inside focusing on the breath and the body, I, even though I was looking at the client and listening to them, I was really in my mind focusing on my breath body and on um, on my reaction yeah the way i was reacting my experience inside mm. not outside yeah and that's how you protect yourself and protect others by doing that 
by having that consciousness of your unconscious process because the other person is not conscious of their unconscious process, right? Yeah, they're not aware that um, what they're doing. They're just, they just, well, actually, they know <laughs> this is the thing. The reason why some of them react the way that in that manner is because they think that if they react in that manner, they will get what they want. Mm -hmm. And I think in some situations it works, but um, it would only work if they if it re really escalated and given if if under the necessary conditions, yeah, it would work sometimes, yeah. but not always. And when they see that they can't, you they can't pull your strings to make you react how how they would I'd like you to react. You know, they change. Give up. They, they let go. They have to change their tune. And they realize they have no power over you. And they, they change their tune unconsciously. Like they were unconscious of the first part and, and they be they're unconsciously changed as well. And because they maybe they're unaware of this universal wave and this connection. So you practice the teaching of all Buddhas and you practice this real alchemy. And I wanted to bring this Dhammapada verse because your practice reminded me of it. And it was the first real teaching of the Buddha that I got, like first real teaching from the words of the Buddha directly, which thank you, Bhante Sinivasa, for sharing that with me uh, all those years ago. So, yep, I... Uh, that's the alchemy. Anyone who wants to practice it, we give up what is uh, evil or emotional. We cultivate what is good, which in this case was the introspection. And we purify our mind in this method. You know, some people like to say that Buddhist meditation, there's many meditations. They try to say that there's the Abhidhamma will say there's 40 different types of meditations. Abhidhamma is uh, the practice of Buddhism that came up hundreds of years after the Buddha and they, where they were trying to get into debates with the Mahayana Buddhist monks and they were both trying to show off to each other and say who the what the real higher teachings are of the Buddha. And so they come up with these, the, what they call the Abhidhamma and they try to say that there's 40 different types of meditation. But honestly, here the Buddha says this is the practice of all Buddhas. So there's only one type of meditation. That one type of meditation is to give up what is evil, to practice what is good, and to purify your mind in this fashion. There might be different subjects of meditation, like breathing or metta, or the, the meditation on reflecting on death, or the... You know, all those meditations, like uh, seeing the, the decay in, of a corpse. Uh, there's many types of meditations, but every meditation, your goal is to remove the unwholesome, to remove the emotional, and to cultivate the good. The pe good here means peaceful, means free of emotion. And this this method will purify your mind. And Juan, you said, you said give up what is evil. Practice what is good. And what else? Purify your own mind. Oh, and then also, I would like to say thank you to Bante Colita for teaching me how to meditate. Yes, the, the master of awareness. <laughs> yeah, because he was the one in my first class who instructed us, and he was the one I learned from. Yes. Thank you, Bhante Kalita. You, you, every Friday, you give us the instructions. You answer our questions. You, you are the, you are the shepherd of uh, our flock. You know, we all go there new to Buddhism and you teach us the right way. So thank you, Bhante, for teaching us the, the Buddha's practice. Thank you. So, yeah, so, um, that was the Dhammapada verse number 183. I'm, uh, I thought w we were pretty succinct and straight to the point, which uh, was wonderful. And uh, last thing, Joanna, I wanted to talk about was a sutra. 
that uh so i don't know i think this week i've been i've been going on a flashback trip you know i've been getting to my zen roots because uh that's how i started this dhamma journey it was through zen through alan watts with the essay that we shared and before i was able to listen to thousands of hours of bonte punaji i listened to thousands of hours of of alan watts and one of the first suttas that i ever encountered was uh this these suttas in a in a section called the sutta nipata so i think i'm pretty sure you're aware of this but there's a basket called the sutta pitaka pitaka means a basket and sutta is the discourses and there's five sections five so-called books in this basket joanna the first book is the long discourses of the buddha the diga nikaya the second book is the Majima Nikaya, the, the medium length discourses, the middle length discourses. The third book is the Samyutta Nikaya, which is the connected verses. All that book, every section is like, it's like a glossary because it has like all the suttas on one subject grouped together and then so on and so on. That's the third book in this basket of suttas. The fourth book is the numerical uh, discourses, which is called the Anguttara Nikaya. Uh, so that means all it's like it goes through, has a bunch of suttas, all that have to do with uh, with one topic. Then it goes to all the suttas that have to do with two topics. Then all the suttas have to do with three topics. Then all the suttas have to do with four to five, with six, with seven, with eight, with nine, with ten. And I think it goes to eleven. Um, uh, that one I have not finished. Uh, the one I, I've, uh, done good work on is the middle length, the, the long discourses and the Samyutta Nikaya, cause it's so interesting. But the fifth book, Joanna is actually not just one book. They call it the, the, hmm, that's a, uh, they call it like the, the group of smaller books. And here there's many books different books in this fifth basket and this fifth section of the basket there's this is where you find the dhammapada and this is where you find other small books like there's one book called the iti vutaka which is a bunch of uh, uh sayings and then there's the udana udana is like the the supernormal uh proclamations of the buddha things that he said that were really important and they have the stories there. I love that Udana. That's where the Bahi. What? Go ahead. Can you say it again? Udana. Udana. That that's U D A N A. Udana, and that means like a exalted, like an exalted utterance, like a supernormal mm -hmm. utterance. That's where the. Read them. Yeah, that's where the Bahia Sutta is. The Bahia Sutta, remember about that uh, gentleman Bahia who got told by the Deva to go look for the Buddha because he was not practicing properly and he needed to learn from yeah. the Buddha and that he was going to die. And so he yeah. he ran all night to get to the Buddha and he ran up to the Buddha while the Buddha was doing his alms round, uh, waiting outside of homes for the people to donate food. And he begged them to teach him. And the Buddha said, "Get it, like, this is not the time. Go, go away. And and. And he said, no, I have to. And th three times he told him to go away and he still didn't go. So the Buddha said, all right, what's this guy's problem? And he realized that this guy's about to die soon. So right there standing on the street while the Buddha was waiting for food, the Buddha gives him a short little utterance, a short little uh, discourse, like literally less than, a, than one paragraph. Like a phrase. Like a phrase. And that woke him up completely. And then... Remember the phrase? Yeah, he said, in the seeing... There is only the seeing. In the hearing, there is only the hearing. In the sensing, there is only the sensing. In the perceiving, there is only the perceiving. Since for you, there is only the seeing in the seeing and only the hearing in the hearing and only the sensing in the sensing and only the perceiving in the perceiving perceiving then there is no you either here in the subjective experience 
and there is no you there in the objective experience. This alone is the end of all suffering. And that that was a case of sudden enlightenment, sudden awakening. That's the Zen in the suttas. That you know, Zen is all about sudden awakening. Here and now, we just talked about Alan Watts saying it's not about getting anywhere. Here and now, waking up. And after that, he he woke up. He wanted to become a monk. The Buddha told them, um, "Go! I can't ordain you until you bring me the robes, so you can uh, wear them." And so he ran off to find the robes, and then he got killed by uh, he got ran over by a bull, and after uh the monks saw him and the buddha told them grab his body we're gonna burn it and we're gonna burn it like a monk he's your brother in the holy life and they asked him like where 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 is he now like you know because they thought that he they didn't know he was awake and they thought he was reborn somewhere and the buddha said they were talking about his they're talking about his um Yeah, they said, where did his perception land, basically? And the Buddha said, in a place where there is no solids, no liquids, no motion, no heat, where there is no sun, where there is no moon, no stars, no light, no darkness, uh, in a place that goes beyond uh, pain and pleasure, uh, th this is where he's gone. Uh, and that was the the exalted utterance, that, that phrase there. And um, But yeah, that's the Udana. That's where that sutta is. But the sutta we're going to discuss today is in the Sutta Nipata. So the Sutta Nipata is a beautiful, beautiful book. And it's um they've re recently like within the last two years made it into a, a writing into English similar to the Majima Nikaya and the Diga Nikaya, so it's out there, Joanna. If you ever want to get it, in this sutta there's different sections, and here, I mean in this book of the Sutta Nipata there's f five sections. The fifth section is called the Para Para Yana Vaga. Para is going means going beyond. Beyond. You know, in, in the Mahayana Buddhism, there's a phrase called gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate, bodhi swaha. That means gate is gone. Para gate is gone beyond. Para sam gate gone beyond the great beyond. Bodhi swaha is like the great awakening. And so para means beyond. Yana, yana is like the vehicle, like the, the ferry boat, the raft that takes you across the shore. Because right now we're on the shore of birth and death. We're in the shore of samsara. We think we exist, so there's birth and death on this shore. We are the point of, of the teachings of the Buddha, the supernormal eightfold way, is to cross the shore. The supernormal eightfold way is the raft that gets us across the shore. What is across the shore? It is the deathless. It is it is a place where there is no birth and death, and it's it's nirvana. So, Padayana Vaga. This whole section is on going uh, the way to the beyond, and this uh, this section. There was all these Brahmins. Uh, remember, uh, Brahmins are like these, the caste that was all religious and educated and rich um, in ancient India. And they all studied the ancient scriptures called the Vedas. And um, these Brahmins heard about a Buddha. These like 16 Brahmins with their teacher heard about the Buddha. And they all r r journeyed to go see him. And each student asked the Buddha a question, a series of questions. And so each chapter in this section is uh, the conversation between one of the students with the Buddha. And this student is Metagu. So I sent you the picture of the sutra. You'll see that it says Metagu 
mana vapucha. So it's basically the, the questions of the young man, Metigu. And it goes like this. He, he, he went up to the Buddha. It was his turn to talk. He was the, the fourth person to talk to the Buddha of the students. And he said, I ask you, gracious one, please tell me this. Uh, that's what the Metigu said. I think you have true understanding and develop the self. So here, he's not saying that the Buddha, there's a self. He's just saying that he's developed himself. He, he's developed himself to the highest point of evolution. So he says, I think you have a true understanding and a developed self. How have these countless kinds of suffering arisen for whoever is in the world? So all this many types of suffering for all of us, because we're all in the world, since we think we exist and we think the world exists, how, how did this, all these sufferings arise for whoever's in the world? And the Buddha answered, you asked me about the origin of suffering, said the Buddha. As I know it, I will declare it to you. And then he said this, it is because of personalizing objects that there are many kinds of suffering that originate for whoever is in the world. The foolish one without wisdom personalizes objects. The foolish one without wisdom personalizes objects and comes to suffering again and again like a fool. Therefore, knowing this, do not personalize any object. Seeing the birth and origin of suffering. So remember the Paticca Samuppada, Joanna? Yes. You know, we, we are all unconscious of how we start experiencing reality. You know, because we are unconscious, the, the mind, the mental uh, activity starts creating, constructing. Okay. And because it starts constructing, then there's perception of what was constructed. And when there's perception of what was constructed, it, it puts a name to the image that was constructed. And when it puts a name to the image that was constructed, it then uses the information of all six senses to really interpret what it has perceived. And when it uses the information of all six senses to really interpret what it has perceived, it comes up with a, a cognitive interpretation. And when we use all six senses, that's how we become aware of something called an object. Right now, Joanna, you're holding a mic. Am I wrong? No, you're correct. So you're holding a mic. How do you know that there is a mic in your hand? Because my senses can feel it. Yeah, you have these nerve receptors in your, in your fingers in your hand that are getting the sensation of something solid, right? Yeah. And then if you if you tap on, if you tap on it, it makes a noise too. And maybe you can smell the mic smells new. It might smell new. And you know if you licked it, it might have a taste. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're getting all this, all these different uh, sense information because of this sense experience, because th there really is no object there, Joanna, that is in your hand. There really is no hand either. All there is is the sensations that you're perceiving. And when you perceive the sensations, you, you give it a name and an image. And because you're using all the senses, now you create an object with your, cog with your cognition. So when you create an object with your cognition, there's a feeling that arises uh, associated with that object. The feeling that is associated with that object will either be pleasant, painful, or neutral. And that feeling, whether it's pleasant, painful, or neutral, will have an emotional reaction uh, attached to that. Based on whether it's pleasant, there's going to be a the desire to obtain and, and keep it permanent pleasure. If it's painful, there's going to be the hatred of that painful feeling. You try to get away from it. And if it's neutral, there's a emotional uh, feeling that there's something existing there. So 
when there is an emotional reaction based on the feeling that came because of the object that was cognized based on the six senses, the information of the six senses, when there's this emotion, then you start to personalize this emotion and this feeling and this cognit cognitive process and the six senses and the name and the image and the perception. You start personalizing everything because all that is subjective and you say, this is mine. Well, when you personalize, you create the idea that there's something existing. And when you think there's something existing, especially when you think you exist, you think there is birth, aging, sickness, and suffering, and death and suffering. So here the Buddha said, they, the Buddha was asked, I ask you about the origin of suffering. As, uh, please tell me, how are these countless kinds of suffering, or how do they arise in someone and whoever's in the world? And the Buddha said, it is because of personalizing objects that these many kinds of suffering originate for whoever's in the world. And the foolish one without wisdom personalizes these objects and they come to, to, into the experience of suffering again and again like a fool. Therefore, knowing this, do not personalize any object because you see the birth and origin of suffering. You see how suffering comes into being. So that's what the Buddha is saying in that first section. He wants you to see this experience called Paticca Samuppada so that you don't personalize. So far, does that all make sense? Yeah. So then he goes on to ask the Buddha. And by the way, the reason this sutra stood out for me is because that personalizing objects, it's called upadi, upadi. And upa means inside. And, you know, we've heard the word upadana, which is the personalizing. Um, it means to take in what, whatever, like take in as mine, which is personalizing. And upadi means to personalize the objects. So everything, we just discussed how the mic doesn't exist. There's no object called the mic. All there is is the sensations, but it's your own interpretation that thinks that there is an object called the mic. And so you're, when I say you, I say uh, the you called us, you know, all of us, we personalize these objects. And it is because we personalize these objects that we ourselves created that there is suffering. And this is what the Buddha told this young gentleman. But the, the young gentleman wasn't done there. He, he then went on to ask, he said, you have proclaimed to us what we asked you about. Another thing we ask, come on, please answer it. And he asked, how do the wise one cross over the flood? The flood here, Joanna, is the flood of, of emotions. He says, how do we, the wise ones, cross over the flood of birth? old age, grief, and lamentation. That's the jati, birth, jara, old age, soka, grief, and padideva, lamentation. How do the wise one cross over the flood of birth, old age, grief, and lamentation? Please explain this to me, O oh great sage. And then the Buddha, he said, and then he says, please explain this to me, O oh great sage, for this since for you you have knowledge of this experience since this experience has been known by you because he's the buddha samasam buddha the tathagata the one who has crossed over and the buddha answered i sh i shall proclaim the teaching to you metagu which is which when it, when this teaching is practiced immediately there's freedom from danger and knowing this, behaving attentively, you can cross over attachment to all the world. So he's saying that if you practice attentively, as here it says, sato charam. Sato is for sati, attention, and charam is your behavior. 
He says, when you when you are completely attentive, you can cross over all attachment to the world. So pain, why would paying attention help us in our behavior? The paying attention is paying attention to this process of perception and cognition and emotion and personalizing and existence. So we pay attention and we act according to this attention because someone who's looking inside will no longer be dominated by emotions. This freedom from danger is freedom from emotion. So when you get confronted by a client full of emotion who may be trying to manipulate you, what do you do? You look inside, right? Yeah. So by looking inside, because, yes, go ahead. Yeah, when you look inside, that's how you're paying attention. You're paying attention to what's going on in the body. How you're going into the mind and into the body, seeing how the mind is affecting the body, and how the body is starting to react. Then when you become aware of that, you can intervene mm. and take control of your body, take the control back. Mm. And do you personalize when you pay attention? No. So that's how you uh, be by personalize. You mean like, um, do I do you start do you start thinking as this is my body and it's being attacked by that person uh, no i don't think this is my body i just think oh uh my heart is beating fast oh i'm not breathing right oh my stomach is tight oh my body is tense oh, i'm gonna breathe now hmm. i'm gonna relax now you become conscious. Yeah, but I don't think, oh, this is my body. This is my feelings. This is, this is my, uh, this is my, I don't think about it as this is, I mean, I thought this is my, my heart is beating fast. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't really dwell on the idea of my body. I just, was focusing on what's going on in this body, this body. Do you think that attention you cultivated allowed you to become free from danger? Uh, allowed me to become free from danger. The da I don't the, think the danger I really... of the danger of becoming emotional. Oh, yeah. Oh my God, I didn't realize that. Yes, when you become emotional, you are dangerous. So, You're crazy. Absolutely. The the Buddha used the word called umata, which means you're mad, like crazy. So, so then that means yes, yes, I became free from from emotions, which gave you the freedom from danger. Yes. So I mean. I guess I possibly could have been in danger, but not out of my own actions. Yes. Which that's, if someone kills us, if we harbor no ill will, there's nothing bad that's going to happen to us. You know, this body might stop breathing, but nothing bad happened to us. <laughs> I mean, there is no us, but we, we protected our own mind, which is the goal of, of Buddhism. That's the Sachita Pariyodapanan. When when Jesus was getting crucified, he wasn't he wasn't he was protecting his own mind. He loved everybody, even while he was being crucified. Yeah, he said, uh, "God forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. What they do." So he was aware that you know, human the the average human was ignorant of. Uh, their actions and what they were doing. So even though they were uh, crucifying the, him, and they had they were criticizing him, and uh, he was saying, "Forgive them," you know, because they don't they don't they're not aware of what they're doing. They don't even 
understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. So here you can see that by practicing immediately, like doing the practice now, that's the point of Zen. Now, do the practice now. It's here. By practicing immediately, you become free from danger when you know this and you behave attentively. That's how one crosses over the attachment to the world, meaning the attachment, the cross, you stop personalizing, which the Buddha said that personalizing objects is how one suffers. That's the origin of suffering. And so the end of the sutta, he says, the gentleman who asked, he says, I greatly rejoice in that supreme teaching, great seer, which having understood and behaving attentively, one can cross over attachment to the world. Whatever you know, and then the Buddha says, whatever you know, above, below, across, and middle, dispel the enjoyment of and settling on these things. And the perception and one will not remain in existence. I don't think I sent you the, the last page of it, Joanna, so I'm sorry. But yeah, that's what okay. that's what he says. And um, there's more to it, but I think... How much time have we reached? We're at two hours, so you read my mind. I was going to say, I think that is enough for today. Uh, I went over for what I wanted to discuss of that sutta, which is the origin of suffering is personalizing the objects. And the objects, there is no objects out there. All there is is the objects you formed with your own cognitive process by using the information of the six senses that you perceive. There is no mic. There is no bed that you're lying on. There is no chair that you're sitting on. It's just the sensations in your butt, uh, the nerve cells in your butt that are being sent up to the, to, up the spine to your brain. And you think there's something solid. You think there's an object. Cause, but it's not. You have to be attentive to what's happening inside. And to be attentive that there's an organism in the, being stimulated by the environment. And also that living and uh, behaving attentively is how you cross over the, the flood. The flood of birth, aging, sickness, and death. And... By behaving attentively, practicing this immediately, this practice immediately here and now, that's the freedom from danger, the danger of emotions, of becoming emotional. Because if you become free from the danger of emotions, you, you are safe. You've reached the true safety. You cannot find safety in going anywhere in the world physically. You, become, you, you, you reach the safety in your own mind. And um, that was the uh, the main teaching that I wanted to share from this sutta, the questions of Metagu. It's uh, Sutta Nipata number 5.5 .5 for anyone who wants to read it. But uh, yeah, I think that is all for tonight. Uh, any last, last words, Joanna? No, just thank you so much, Juan. Thank you again for sharing your wisdom and uh, reading these amazing um articles and writings regarding alan watts and uh the dhammapada yeah my my pleasure uh thank you for for always being here and understanding it, all my nonsense <laughs> and uh <laughs> You know, it's it feels good, you know, because, you know, a lot of times when you speak this way, you and people don't understand what the heck you're talking about, <laughs> you know, it, it seems like you're the crazy one. But uh, <laughs> there are those yeah. with uh, he ears to hear and eyes to see. So thank you, Joanna. Well, thank you. I was going to say, I think you did a good job explaining it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think you did as well. Um, I want to say a special thank you to the most venerable Bonte Kalita, our teacher. That's the second time he gets thanked tonight, and he's well deserved. He, uh, I was uh, had some doubts about the Pali and the Sutta I just read, and um, he removed all doubt, as the Buddha would to his disciples. So thank you, Bonte Kalita, Vandana. Um, 
And that will be it for tonight. I hope all beings out there be uh, that I hope you're all well, happy, comfortable, and peaceful, free from harm, free from suffering, free from difficulties. And I hope you all live with ease. Thank you very much. Suki Hotu.